All right. Well, the production process is where we left off when we were together last time. And just to do a real, real quick recap, um, we started talking through the process itself and talked through the different steps here and the fact that uh, the trigger for this process is the planned order. And we see the sequence of steps here that we will revisit in more detail before our discussion is done. And we spent a fair amount of time in our last discussion talking about different types or kinds of manufacturing. We talked about how for a lot of companies what they make you could visualize as an assembly line that's just kind of kicking out a stream of units. Uh, but for other organizations it's more process oriented. And we observe things like chemicals and petroleum um, I'm going to guess, but I have no idea, maybe things like toothpaste would be made in terms of process manufacturing, but maybe I'm wrong about that. The one thing we do see, though, that is true for most organizations is typically we think in terms of repetitive manufacturing. It wasn't on the slide, but we wrote in kind of the, the corollary to repetitive manufacturing is custom <coughs> manufacturing, where we're looking at making very, very custom, one-of-a-kind items, but typically for most companies what they engage in is repetitive manufacturing. And then we talked about at a high level here some of the strategies that companies will employ related to their production process. And the fundamental idea here is to what degree our production is coupled to specific orders. You know, it's one thing for us to say we have these in terms of our sales expectations and so we will base our production on forecasts and our experience. It's a whole nother thing to say this is what we have in terms of our sales orders and those specific sales orders drive our production and everything that gets made gets made in response to an order. I, I think, uh, I, I don't know that I used this analogy last time, but to give you an example, if if you went out to eat at a kind of a nice sit-down restaurant, let's say for example like a, I don't know, a Red Lobster, a Texas Roadhouse, a place like that, and you ordered your entree, they would make that entree to order for you, which would very much be reflective of make to order. But um, and I, I'm not intimately aware of this, but I, I know that like a lot of fast food restaurants at certain busy times of the day, they make, you know, let's just make a bunch of cheeseburgers, let's make a bunch of french fries, and then as people come in and order them, they pull out of that stock. So when they cook a particular batch of cheeseburgers, it's not like they already have those designated as going to customer orders, they're just making them in anticipation of future orders. That's more consistent with the make to stock philosophy. And as I think we observed last time, the same company could engage in different strategies as it relates to different products. I'll go back to my Red Lobster example. It may well be that Red Lobster cooks your entree to order, but things like salad and rolls and other things like that that are part of the meal, they just make those in large batches on a continuous basis. So you certainly can put together a hybrid strategy that makes the most sense in terms of your organization. Well, so moving on to our first bit of, of new content here, organizational data relevant to production. And the good news about this is we've talked about so much organizational data so far, there's really nothing new here. The client is relevant because as we have observed, the client is relevant for everything. You really can't find anything that we have talked about this semester that exists outside of the scope of the client. So uh, that's always a really easy one to, to put in its place. Company code. Hopefully at this point your brain is tuned to thinking company code and financial accounting just go hand in hand. And so obviously there's an accounting uh, implication to what we're doing in production. So the company code is relevant. The plant takes on really two different contexts here. It is where we engage in production, but it also serves as our storage location, which means that perhaps we are pulling raw materials from the plant, and then we're also putting finished goods back in the plant. So 
the plant is relevant for a number of different reasons and storage location is really just a, a function of the plant in that respect as to where in the plant things are coming from and where they are going. So that's organizational data relevant to production. We can move on pretty quickly because there's not really anything new there or needing us to uh, belabor. So let's talk about master data. The material master that we have talked about before obviously is relevant for us in production and we'll, we'll say a little bit more about what facets of the material master record uh, come into play most significantly. Uh, something that is new for us in terms of class discussion, but you have, bless you, seen before in your lab work and then also experienced in your work with ERP SIM, the bill of materials is another element there. That really should say bill of materials, not bill of material. Um, a work center. This is a new thing for us that we will talk about in a, a little bit of detail. And then product routing slash task list. And then something called a production resource tool or PRT. So of that set, either the last three or the last four of them are things that are new for us, but otherwise uh, not a lot here in terms of new master data for us to talk about in, in terms of the production process. So let's uh, visit some of these in a little bit more detail. The material master. There are views that we have already discussed in other contexts that are still relevant here. The basic data view. Remember, this is where we're getting things like the name of the material, the size of the material, whether we denominate it in terms of each or perhaps pounds or gallons or whatever the unit associated with an item is. Those are things that are all going to be pulled from the basic data view from uh, the material master. There are a lot of purchasing related views on the material master that we talked about in the context of purchasing. Well, those are relevant for us here as well, because obviously, particularly if we are looking at some kind of make to order scenario, we get an order and we're going to have to figure out the, the constituent components that we might need to purchase to fulfill a particular order. And so purchasing might come up in that scenario. Uh, sales related views are going to be relevant because we're going to be selling these things, and so uh, those are still relevant for us here. And then accounting-related things. Uh, things that are going to come into play here is this idea of we take a given set of raw materials and we turn them into a finished good or a semi-finished good, and that kind of transformation of value is going to need to be captured here in, in our processes. So these are all things that we've talked about before, and, and there's no real need for us to revisit them in detail at this point, since you can just refer back to our, our previous notes and discussion. But there are some other things that are on the material master that we haven't talked about that are there particularly for, for production. One of them is the work scheduling view. Now the work scheduling view is particular to a given plant. And it is plant specific, and this is key here, execution data. So the idea would be how long does it actually take us to make this item? Do you recall in some of your lab work where you went in and you said that this would take this particular period of setup time, this particular period of actual uh, work time. Uh, your lab kept that very, very simple, but for every material that we make, we have the ability to specify execution data because, for example, if we uh, are going through an available to promise uh, evaluation, we might need to know that it will actually take us three days to make this material from a given start time. And so we find that material on the work scheduling view of the material master. Similarly, MRP is a view. It's actually spread out over three different tabs. 
in our look at a given material. We have MRP 1, 2, and 3 as individual tabs. This is plant specific and notice the important distinction here. This is plant specific planning data. And one of the things that we will come back to in our discussion is the way that MRP can be controlled in the context of our production planning. All of you, I trust, have experience with MRP from your previous experience with ERP SIM. And hopefully you remember the basics of that process, but one of the things you might recall is that the MRP transaction, when you went to run it on the screen that came up, you had a whole set of, of different fields here that in the context of ERP SIM, all you did was call up this transaction and hit the execute button. Well, all of these squares here, which were pre-populated for you, are different parameters that we can set to control how MRP execution will actually occur. And so this relates to things on the material master that would help us appropriately plan for future production of a given item. This would influence the material purchasing. This would influence other things related to planning the production. So notice the important distinction here. The work scheduling view focuses on execution. How long is it going to take us to make it? Things like that, where MRP focuses on the planning process in getting ready to engage in production, which would include things like acquiring resources and how we actually do the calculation of, of how much we actually intend to make. And we're going to see things in this regard in terms of concepts like safety stock and other things of that sort that we can set for particular materials that you didn't see in your previous use of MRP just because we wanted to keep it simple. There are other views on the material master that might be relevant to us in production. Quality management. Are we inspecting the materials after they are after they are manufactured. We talked before about the concept of if we're using quality management, then in our purchasing process, we could have materials come in and not be cleared to be classified as unrestricted materials until they went through inspection. And so we would buy them, they would go to a stock status of in inspection, and then once they cleared inspection, we would use a uh, transfer order to change the status from in inspection to unrestricted. Well, we could do the same thing here. The output of our production, instead of going directly into unrestricted, could go into into inspection. And then after it passes inspection, then it gets checked into the warehouse and is available for us to sell. We do have forecasting views. We do have classification views, which uh, we may touch on a little bit further as we go through details of some of the processes here. So that's the material master. This is not a new thing for us. Or actually, excuse, no, this is not a new thing for us. We have talked about the material master a lot this semester. And hopefully you have picked up on the idea that the material master is pretty much involved in, in every process out there. It is one of the core data elements in an ERP system because a lot of what we focus on in an ERP system is keeping track of our resources, valuing those resources, controlling those resources, and, and so on. So, new item, at least in terms of our formal discussion, bill of materials. A bill of materials identifies the components needed to make a particular material. You can think of this as almost like a recipe, but it's distinct from a recipe in one regard. A recipe normally lists the ingredients that you need to make something and then gives you the steps. A bill of material essentially only lists the ingredients. It is just a list of the individual components needed to make the material. And it does not give the actual instructions. That's a different master data record. So the bill of material just gives us the components. 
an important thing to realize in SAP ERP, and this is different from a variety of other ERP systems, is that all of the bills of material that you see in SAP ERP are, are single level. So it's in some systems, you might be looking at product one. And when you drill down to look at the bill of material for product one, you see a component there called assembly unit. And that assembly unit has its own set of resources associated with it. And so you kind of have a bill of materials that has like this multiple levels to it. Well, in SAP, what they do is every component has its own bill of materials. And so you can wind up almost with a uh, recursive type structure, and you have to be careful not to create a, an infinitely recursive structure. They've, they've solved this problem, but in the context of ERP SIM, one semester, a student group, um, when they were adjusting their bill of material for boxes of blueberry muesli, instead of putting blueberries in as an ingredient, they put boxes of blueberry muesli in as an ingredient. So to make a box of blueberry muesli, you had to start with a box of blueberry muesli as an input. And the really fun thing is when the computer tries to explode the bill of materials and calculate requirements, it just kind of goes into this endless loop of, OK, to make that, I need a box of blueberry muesli. But then to make that, I need a box of blueberry muesli. Oh, I need another box of blueberry muesli. You know, we, we, we don't want that to happen, clearly. And so the strategy here for avoiding that is we say, Everything in a bill of materials is just single level, but any of the items that you list as a material, that could be a raw material, or the material that's listed there could be something that has its own bill of materials. And so that's the way this is handled in, in SAP ERP. The bill of materials is really, really important. Why? Well, first of all, it is going to be used in the MRP process to figure out how, how much of something we need, to, we need in order to engage in, in production. It is used in the production process for things like material staging. For us to say, OK, we're getting ready to make 25,000 boxes of blueberry muesli. How much of how many blueberries do we need? How many bags do we need? How many boxes do we need? Because we've got to retrieve those out of storage and, and we've got to stage that. Procurement goes hand in hand with the first of these bullet points in terms of material planning here. But realize the distinction here is the MRP process might have decided we need 18,000 kilograms, but we already have some. So procurement here is actually focused more on the actual buying. And we, of course, realize that we might not have to buy this many kilograms because we might have some on hand. But the, the fundamental data usage is very, very similar because we're focused on how much do we need and other key things like that. Product costing is really, really important. And this gets to the heart of a lot of things that we do in costing and profitability analysis. Because if I really want to dig into what are my true costs of goods sold for given materials, undoubtedly I'm going to want to break that down into their constituent components and then look at the cost factor for each of those components. And so where I get that from is going to be the bill of materials. And of course, you could have a situation where you have a given product that you make that has eight uh, items in it that make up the bill of materials. And in your costing analysis, some of these things might have very uh, uniform and standardized prices, where some of these items, the price might be highly volatile. And so out of that can come different purchasing strategies uh, based on the costs and other things of that sort. So in that respect, the bill of materials is very, very important to us in, in getting a true picture of our cost here. This uh, image from your book illustrates what I was talking about in terms of a single level bill of material. It, it might seem like a, a non-important fact, but just to realize the way this works is, if I look at the bill of materials for a given finished good, it might tell me that to make that finished good, I need these three materials. Well, the raw materials is something I buy, 
but the semi-finished goods, those are things that I make as well. And so this particular semi-finished good here on the far left has its own bill of material that has its own items as well. And so when we are evaluating the bills of material, this is what is often called uh, exploding the bill of materials to get down to an actual complete list of all of the components that would need to be on hand in order to engage in, in manufacturing. Questions? Yes, sir. If it were a multi-level bill of material, this would be one bill of material. And it would be one bill of material that would be stored together in the computer as one data record. And it might present itself visually in a number of different ways. It could be like a, you know, a, a list where it's like, OK, you need this and this and this. But for this, you need this. And for this, you need this. You know, you could see almost like a hierarchical structure. You could present it as a drill down or something like that. But the big idea is that when we say single level bills of material, what's on this screen is three different bills of material. The alternative would be for this to be one bill of material. The nice thing about it being multi or being single level is now this semi-finished good could be a component in many, many different finished goods. So by having it having its own bill of material, it's very easy for me to include that. Whereas if it were just a part of this overall main single bill of materials, now I, I kind of have a, a challenge and in, in I'm having to replicate data in places where it would be better to just have it stand able to stand alone. Other questions, comments about that? All right, so let's look at a bill of material. Bill of material, like most documents, has a header section and, and has a line item section. And so you'll notice some things here. The header gives us the material. It gives us the plant. It gives us the usage. We'll talk more about that in, se in a second here. Validity. Uh, here it just says date, but the idea here is um, the date of the the dates associated with this bill of material. For example, maybe we're a watch company, and there's a particular model of watch that we've made for 50 years now. And if you go back in time, you know, like from 1975 to 1982, when we made this watch, we used these components. But then in 1982 uh, to 19 we'll say 1999, same watch, really looks the same as far as the, what the end customer sees, but we change some of the components. So you can have a given material that has multiple bills of material. And so one of the things that you would have to check is, am I using the right one for the time period in question? And we'll talk more about why that's important here in, in just a few moments here. We can have a bill of material that's not actually active in the system, maybe because we're planning a new product. And so this is something that's out there for that purpose, but we can't actually use it at the moment. Base quantity. We'll come back and talk about these on the next slide here. But the point is we have a header section, which as we know is universal for the entire the entire um, item in question. And then we have in the line items section, you'll notice a few things here. Um, item category, which we'll say more about on the next slide. And then just the specification of the materials that we are using in, in this production. And so the material along with their description, and then how many. And once again, if you can recall your work with ERP SIM, you can really visualize this in the system. As you'll recall, going to the screen that presented a grid, like almost an Excel worksheet. And you could go in and change quantities of raw ingredients. You could go in and uh, change out one raw ingredient from being blueberries to strawberries or whatever have you. So you've worked with this bomb structure in your actual interaction with the system before. Let's dig into a couple of these things in a little bit more detail. The header, as we've already observed, applies to the entire bill of material. Status. A bill of material can have one of two status. It can be active or it can be inactive. I don't really know that we need to say much about that, but 
that's one of the elements of the header in a bill of material. Every bill of material has a base quantity. And that is, if you will, if we go back to our recipe analogy, this is the yield of this particular bill of materials. When you did your bill of materials for making your muesli for your ERP sim, quantity, ERP sim company, your bill of material specified what went into one box of blueberry muesli. Well, it very well could be that depending upon what we are making, we don't specify the quantities in terms of a single unit. One example of that goes back to something we talked about last time and reviewed a bit at the beginning of our time together today. The one unit really makes sense if we are thinking in terms of repetitive manufacturing and discrete goods, but it doesn't work too well if we're talking process manufacturing. You know, in process manufacturing, we may be thinking about specifying quantities in, in could be gallons, for example, or it could be some other dimension other than a single unit. Keep in mind as well that depending upon what we're actually doing here, you could have one process that you use if you're making, let's say, single units. And you could have another divergent way of making things when you make them in batches of 100. So you could have a bill of materials associated with a single unit, and for that same material, you could have a bill of materials for a different base quantity because maybe the components change when, when you do that. Um, bills of material have different usage. You have a production bill of materials, which is probably the most common usage and, and what we have been talking about here as being a bill of material that we're going to actually use to drive the production. But sometimes you have a, a costing bill of materials where the focus there is similar. You're describing what goes into making a particular material, but your focus more is on, on counting the cost associating with things. And you can imagine, for an example, a scenario where we have a product We'll call this product X. And as a point of fact, there are three different ways we could make product X. We could make it with these components, we could make it with these components, and we could make it with these components. And to the end consumer, they all look identical. But if we opened up the item and looked inside, we'd actually see that the circuitry, the components, the materials, whatever have you, are, are actually different. Well, this could be then three different bills of material, and we might want to do a costing analysis uh, to figure out which of these three is better. We might have other things that would come into play here as well. Why would, what's another scenario where having alternate bills of material like this would be useful for an organization? Why else might you do this other than just to figure out which one's the, the cheapest from a costing perspective. Maybe like a quality standard to change up for if it has something that fails more often than others. Okay. So All right. Different going into it. All right, that makes sense to me. I could see that where where um, it looks like the same product but from a quality performance standard it's different. Um, that sounds logical to me. Okay, and that gets to the heart of, of what I was thinking of was maybe, for example, this is this one right here uh, involves a, a new component that we've never used before. Maybe this component right here is something that we can use, but we can only use it in one of our plants because it requires special equipment to handle or to incorporate into production. And so if we're making this in plant A, this is the bill of materials we use. If we're making it in plant C, 
this is the bill of materials that we use. So you could have one material, you know, this could all be product DXTR157, but depending upon where it's made, it's actually a little bit different. You see this, for example, in automotives. If you were to take a particular car that's made in different manufacturing plants, you could take two units of that car, park them side by side. Most people look at them and say, well, they're identical cars. But then if an automotive expert kind of started taking the cars apart, they might tell you, well, this one has a newer transmission unit. This one's using a different wiring harness. There might be subtle differences based on how it's done in different manufacturing facilities. And so this gives us a way to, to differentiate them in that respect. Anybody else have another scenario why we might have differences here? I thought I saw another hand, so I don't want to cut anybody off. All right. So here's exactly what I was alluding to, the plant. Um, this bill of materials right here might be the bill of material for DXTR for plant A. And, and here's that same material, but for, for plant B. And this gets back to exactly what I was just talking about. Every plant could have its own different bill of materials for the same product. And so this gives us a way to approach that. Sometimes this is because of what I just mentioned, which is equipment availability. It might, on the other hand, be that maybe plant A is on the west coast of the United States in California, and plant B is on the east coast, and we'll say North Carolina, and, and maybe there are laws or regulations or even just material differences, uh, material availability differences, where this particular material right here is an abundance on the West Coast. And so we can source it very inexpensively. So we use it on the West Coast, but it's not available in a cost-effective manner to us on the East Coast. So instead, we use this in its place because we can get it on the East Coast much more readily. So this gives us the ability to manufacture what, what would be viewed as the same product, but using different bills of material based on the way it's done in, in a particular plant. Now, keep in mind, the intent is here for this to all be fundamentally the same product and look the same to the customer. If it's a car and this one has four wheels and this one has five wheels when we're done, which I realize would be an odd car, but you know, if, if we look at it and you say those aren't the same product, then that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about something that to the consumer would look like the exact same product. Question or comment? I think I saw somebody. All right. Any questions or comments before we go ahead? All right, validity. We talked about that on the last slide. This is the date range that the bill of material is valid for. And, and so the point here is it is possible for a single material to have multiple bills of material out there. And so we have to be sure that we're looking at the right one given a particular context. You know, if we work in plant A, we want the bill of material for making the material in plant A. And going back to what we talked about before, in plant A, it might take us two days to make this product. In plant B, we use slightly different components and it only takes us a day and a half. So obviously now we're seeing there's going to be differences in cost and other factors, but that's not that unusual. I would say that the, the corollary to this is this is why a lot of, of companies do build factories that are just focused on a small set of materials. For example, um, Nissan has a manufacturing plant in Tennessee, and I'm trying to remember where it is in Tennessee. Smyrna. Smyrna? And at one point, that's where they made all of the Nissan Leafs, those little electric cars. I don't know if that's still the case or not. Anybody know? At one point, at least, that was where they were all made worldwide. If you bought a leaf anywhere in the United States, it came out of Smyrna, Tennessee. And they particularly had to outfit that, that plant with all of the resources needed to assemble battery-driven cars, which are very, very different than cars that work with more traditional combustion engines. 
And so Nissan might say, okay, we're gonna take that plant and turn it into a plant to make pickup trucks, which would mean they'd have to retool the whole plant. So typically what they'll do is, is they'll build a plant and outfit it with certain equipment and only assign certain products to be made there. And the idea of creating a generic plant that would make every product is, is not realistic. You know, that's like if we go back to ERP SIM, that was kind of a, a, a very unusual situation, uh, but you're only making a limited set of products, you're making cereal. But maybe we work for a company that makes cereal and breakfast bars, and breakfast bars are made in one plant and cereals made in a different plant. That's pretty typical. But this at least allows us the option of having materials made in multiple plants and realizing that the process, or at least the components, could be different from one to the next. So this is all the stuff in the header section of the bill of material. As we look at the line items, what you will see is a grid like you have seen before that lists the, uh, the material code, the material number, uh, the description, the quantity, and then the item category. And so that is, is one of the leftmost columns there. And so we might see, for example, that a given item is a stock item, which means that it has a material master. So when we made blueberry muesli, we needed blueberries. Blueberries would have a material master. We needed oats. Oats have a material master. Now keep in mind, just because something has a material master doesn't mean that we make it. Raw materials have material masters, but so too do trading goods and semi-finished goods and so on. So something that shows up on the bill of material as a stock item, that's just telling us, okay, this is a reference to a material that we have a material master for. You could have, however, something referred to on the bill of materials that has no material master at all. What did we call materials that we buy and use that don't have a material master? Consumables, okay, so that's what we're talking about here. We could have a reference to consumables on a material master. What would that be? Well, maybe, for example, this is a bill of material that we're going to use to assemble a transmission, okay? And so it would list belts and flywheels and other things, bolts and other things that are going to make that. But then there might be a reference to, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, grease. Because as you're putting this stuff together, you, you grease it. And, and it just so happens that on the assembly line, we have big barrels of grease. And so periodically, the worker just goes over and, and puts some grease in a container. And then when they're putting the stuff together, they just, you know, will dab that into certain places. It's not even like we have a specified thing. It's not like the worker says, okay, I need to put a tablespoon of grease on this. And they measure it out very precisely. It doesn't work that way. We just know we're going to put some grease on this. And so if we don't list it on the bill of material, then we don't account for it, which means that if we run out of grease, we can't make this stuff. So there will be things that we will have listed that are things that are a part of what we need to assemble to make this item, but it's, it's not something that we actually have a material master for because it is a consumable. I will say as an aside, remember we did say that if there's a consumable item that we buy with frequency, we could have a material master for it. So you could see there being a material master for grease. Matter of fact, I think it's probably pretty likely that an automobile assembly plant would have something like that as a consumable material. Variable sized items. So this is something that I, I don't know that we have, have talked about before, which is if you think about a bill of material listing the components, and we think of the idea of specifying the size of those components. So if we go back to making blueberry muesli, you know, you might have said put 0.2 kilograms of blueberry in each box and 0.25 kilograms of nuts and this much oats and this much wheat. And we think about the bill of material being very, very precise. Well, sometimes you have 
where you're making items in different sizes, and so you have to specify the actual size as a part of specifying what it is that, that you're making. And so this could actually be where you're specifying dimensions. Uh, I'm trying to think of a really good example of this. Um, one that I can think of is there are companies that will come to your home and make gutters for your home. And they make those gutters to be seamless and they're measured to the exact dimension of your home. And so they come out to the job site with a roll of metal and then they take measurements and then they roll out the metal to the precise size on the job site. And so every job that they're doing, they use the same set of materials, but, but the actual metal itself is going to be variable in terms of one installation versus, versus another. So you can designate something on a material master as being a part of what goes into this, but the dimensions will change. Imagine, and I don't know what a product like this would be, but imagine a factory that had tin sheeting that makes up a part of the assembly. And in the workshop, there are just huge sheets of this. And when the worker is putting an item together, they take a set of tin snips and they go over to the big sheet and they just snip off how much they need, need for this particular item they're making. That's the item, that's the idea here behind a variable sized item. And so when we're actually making a given item, we specify the size in terms of that. And then we have things that are part of the product, but are kind of, if you will, incidental to the product. Blueberry muesli. You made your blueberry muesli, and you put it in a bag, and then you put it in a box. Well, maybe inside of the box was also a puzzle that kids could get out of the box, and they could draw on and solve the puzzle. Well, you don't really manufacture that, but as you're putting the item together, you got to make sure you drop one of those in the box, okay? And so you could imagine making a lot of different things where you make the alarm clock and the bill of materials is focused on the alarm clock, but because the alarm clock goes into a box that also has to have the warranty information and the user's manual, the warranty information and the user's manual, which are documents, they show up here on the bill of material as well because they go into the individual manufacturing. You know, what you would not want to have is you wouldn't want to have a whole bunch of people ready to make a whole bunch of alarm clocks and because you don't have any user's manuals, you can't make them because the user's manual have to go in the box and, and so you can't finish them and put the box there, put the, put the user's manual in later. I'm reminded of, and I wish I could remember what company this was, I think it was Palm, back when the Palm Pilot PDAs were, were really the thing before the era of the smartphone. And I, I think I have this right, that Palm made a whole huge production run and sent them out to retailers and then later realized that the battery that they were using was no good and the batteries basically um, were something that needed to be replaced for the consumer to be able to actually use it. And so they sent like armies of employees out to retail stores and distributors and just had them switch out the batteries and all of the units and then you know, allow the store to sell it. Um, so you know, knowing what goes into particular items and where they were, you, you want to kind of get that right up front because it's very, very painful to, after it, it finishes the manufacturing process, to go out and actually update things. Item category, and as I already observed a moment ago, material number and quantity come into play here as well. So. The bill of materials, an important thing to realize is this is only telling us what goes into making the item as far as the constituent components. Well, the other thing that we need is the manufacturing process, the, the steps in making the item. And before we can get to that, we need to introduce another master data element, and that is the work center. The idea behind a work center is really straightforward. If you in your mind can visualize an assembly line, and maybe the assembly line consists of five different 
stations where some of these are big pieces of equipment, maybe some of these are tables where employees are doing things manually. Every one of these stations is a work center. You know, work center one, work center two, work center three, and, and so on. So work centers are master data that we use in the manufacturing process, and it gives us a way of assigning manufacturing tasks to different parts of our organization. So every work center has a name and a description. And the name and the description could be really straightforward, like I just put here, work center one, work center two. Or this could be like pre-assembly and stamping and electrical testing and, you know, whatever. They could have other names. But every work center has a name and has a description. Every work center has a person responsible for it. This is kind of interesting. You know, SAP is a product that over time, um, a lot of pieces came together at different points in time. It wasn't like SAP ERP was delivered as one full final product. It, it kind of is an evolutionary thing. And, and this always, to me, strikes me as something that you don't see much of anymore, but obviously was a part of the process back when this module was designed. The idea of saying, OK, we have Work Center 1, and it's called stamping, and Bob Smith is in charge of that. You know, the idea of actually associating a particular person with a piece of master data, we, we don't see that that often. As an aside, where have you seen that? in your lab work, assigning actually like a person's name to something. I mean, in our last lab where we assigned the, uh, I forgot, the NA executive. You know. And what was, what was the overall context of that? Yeah, cost objects. So you see cost objects that actually have people's names assigned to them. That's kind of a really odd thing. And it also is the kind of thing that in a lot of companies, they don't use it in quite that fashion. Because it becomes really clunky to say, Work Center 1, uh, Kelly Johnson is in charge of that. And maybe two weeks later, Kelly Johnson moves to a different position. And now we've got to go in and update that. So sometimes you'll see companies that just do things like WC1 supervisor you know, is the person responsible for Work Center 1. But you do have the ability here to actually assign this to individual people with actual real world names. So then the work center has a task list usage. Now the work centers get deployed in routings. And a routing, as we're going to see as we continue here, is the actual sequence of steps that tell us how to make this item. And so the idea here is there are some product routings that may be able to use all of these stations, but there are other routings that aren't allowed to use certain stations. And so this task list usage allows us to say, these are routings that can use this, but these are routings that cannot. You can imagine, for an example, maybe we are a company that makes food products. And maybe we process nuts in Work Center 2. But we also make products that are ones that have to be certified as not having any nut material in them at all. So we certainly would not want to route products that have that certification associated with it through a work center where that's part of the work done there. So this gives us the ability to isolate what work centers can and cannot be used. Capacities. This is a measure of how many units of a material a work center can produce during a given time frame. This is a critical data source for production planning. If you have ever taken, and there may be some of you in this room that have, but I'm guessing the vast majority of you have not, a course in things like production and operations management where you talk about balancing workflow and other things of that sort, this becomes really, really critical. Let me give you a scenario here. Here is Work Center 1, Work Center 2, and Work Center 3. Work Center 3 
has the ability to handle uh, 500 units per hour. Work Center 2 has the ability to handle 250 units per hour. And Work Center 1 has the ability to handle, we'll say, 350 units per hour. I'm going to give you some money to invest in better equipment. Is your money better spent in Work Center 1, 2, or 3? Hopefully you realize the answer to that is 2. And, and you don't have to really think about this mathematically, but just kind of visualize in your mind. Okay, if Work Center 1 is kicking out 350 units an hour, and they're having to go as input into Work Center 2, and Work Center 2 can only kick out 250 units per hour, what's happening, you know, like right here? What are we seeing? Yeah, a bottleneck. We're seeing every hour 100, 100 units are stacking up, which means that, like, the people that work at Work Center 1 could, like, work for three hours and then go take a couple hours off to give the people in Work Center 2 a chance to keep up. And the people in Work Center 3, they're not even having to run their equipment at full capacity because their equipment could go 500 units per hour, but they're only getting 250. And this is why a lot of times in a manufacturing context, a salesman might come in and say, hey, we can sell you a new unit that will help you enable people in Work Center 3 to make 1,000 units an hour. And you're like, so what? You know, 500 units an hour is faster than I need it to be, so faster is not always better. Now, if this were the real world scenario, um, how could we solve this? Somebody tell me one way to solve this problem. Reorder the routing. Okay, I could reorder the routing. The question would be, uh, does it have to go from step one to step two to step three? Could we, could we do it a little bit differently? Could we do step two first? Could we do two, one, and three? Um, and, and that might enable us to do some different things as far as at least employee scheduling. So we could reorder this. What else could we consider doing? Okay, so um, kind of change the dependencies here between the work center, I think, is what's, what's being suggested there. I could also introduce another work center, too, and we could have 2A and 2B, and now these guys are kicking out 250 units an hour. This looks good now in terms of uh, keeping, keeping work center 3 busy because now we've got 500 units feeding into 500 units. But now what you see is Work Center 1 now. You can imagine in a factory where this happened, Work Center 1, they were thrilled because they could kind of take their time and they were still producing enough to keep Work Center 2 busy and they could take long lunches. And then the factory invests in Work Center 2B and now all of a sudden the people in Work Center 1 are being pushed. Hey, work harder, give me more units because I'm standing around with nothing to do in my Work Center 2B. So then we might look at now we, we, we make two Work Center 2s and then in Work Center 1 we invest in better equipment. The point of this is this kind of assembly line balancing is, is something you spend a lot of time working through. You could also do things like in Work Center 1 they work uh, we put them on a 24-hour on a shift. So we're running Work Center 1 day round, and then we just accumulate items, and then the people that work in Work Center 2, that Work Center doesn't operate 24 hours a day. It just operates as many days as we need to, and Work Center 3 only operates during the hours when Work Center 2 is running. Lots of different ways we could solve this, but the fact is a manufacturing plant really is a, a lot about balancing out capacities and trying to figure out a way to make things with maximum efficiency, realizing that equipment constraints come into play, as do human constraints. So this measure of capacity that goes with a work center is really, really critical for us in trying to figure out the most efficient and effective way to manufacture things in our facilities. So work centers have a basic data element to it, aspect to it. These aren't views, 
but you can envision it as being conceptually similar to that. We have capacity information. We have scheduling information. You know, this would be things like um, what hours of days it operates. Does it run 12 hours a day, 18 hours, 24? Is it something where we run it for five days and then we take it down for two days for cleaning and maintenance? Um, one example of this, I, I might have told you this story before in a previous class where I was talking about bills of material and manufacturing. My wife and I a few years ago visited the Celestial Seasonings factory in, I think it's in Boulder, Colorado. And they make all these kind of teas, like cinnamon tea and all these flavored teas. And it was really kind of a cool facility. And um, one of the things that was my favorite is when you, they had one room that was probably three times the size of this room, but five stories tall. So it was a huge room that they called their spice room. And they put all of their spices that they use for making their teas. And so it was all of their mint and just all of that stuff that goes into teas. And the room was sealed with this giant metal door. And when I took the tour, the tour guide said, okay, if any of you have sinus problems, we're gonna solve that problem for you right now. And if any of you are really sensitive to fragrances, you don't wanna do this. But he said, I'm gonna open the door a little bit and those of you that want to can walk in there and I'm gonna shut the door. And I can't begin to tell you what the smell was like. It, I know this sounds weird, but you almost felt like you could smell through your eyes and your ears because it was just like permeating your entire being. It was just the most overwhelming thing I'd ever experienced in there. And they used that when they were making their products. I was kind of surprised that, you know, what they could store in there, but mainly what you smelled was like, imagine like the strongest mint you've ever smelled, but multiplied by 10 million and then just like stuffed into your sinuses so it filled your whole sinuses. I mean, it was just, it was a, a memorable experience, okay? Well, they used that in making their product and they would do a production run and then because they didn't want one flavor to influence the next flavor, they had special crews that came in that wore like the bunny suits like you see in manufacturing facilities and they would use HEPA filters and other things and they would go throughout the factory and, and sanitize and clean all the devices. And it would take them two days to do that. So the, they would run a cam manufacturing campaign for however many days. And then when that was done, all the manufacturing workers got two days off as the, the cleanup workers would come in and clean everything and certify it for the next production run. So capacity and, and things like how we are scheduling things, um, that, that would be a part of this work center definition here. The cost center, Typically, work centers are going to be assigned to different cost centers for the sake of tracking the monetary impact of the work that happens in a cost center. If you think about it this way, we capture cost of goods sold as far as the material cost in the bill of materials, but how do we capture the labor cost associated with cost of goods sold? And the answer is right here because we have workers that will check into, if you will, working on particular jobs. We know how long they worked on it. We know what the output of that was. And so now we can capture labor with as fine a degree of precision as, as we would desire here. And so referencing what I mentioned a moment ago, work centers are different. They're like the only thing where you will actually see employees assigned to work center one. And we do that because we know, okay, Bob, works in work center one. And we know that last week we paid Bob this much money. And we know this is the work that was done in work center one. So now we can account for that from a cost perspective. And so in manufacturing facilities, you will typically assign employees to work centers for the sake of tracking their work uh, across different jobs. Any questions about that? You do have the ability, and I don't know to what degree a lot of companies use this, in this HR assignment, you'll notice that you can not only keep track of, of people, but you can keep track of their positions and their qualifications. So the idea might be that in Work Center 3, um, I actually saw a, a paper factory that had one of these 
it was basically a giant guillotine. And I promise you, if there was somebody you didn't like, if you could get them into that guillotine, you could do what a guillotine does with them. I mean, it was like a big time industrial guillotine that its intended purpose was, was cutting paper. But you would not want to be anywhere near that machine if you didn't know how to operate it. I mean, it was a, a, a very, very dangerous <clears throat> piece of equipment. And so this gives us a way of saying, okay, before someone can be assigned to Work Center 3, they have to have gone to this set of training classes. And maybe they even have to have this professional license or this certification. So this gives us a way to actually make sure that's happening because we can say, okay, before an employee can be assigned to work in Work Center 3, let's check to make sure they have the appropriate qualifications and so on. So we're seeing some things here in terms of the Work Center that we have not really actually seen in any of our other processes so far uh, this, this semester. So we have the Bill of Materials that specifies what goes into stuff. We have the Work Center data which tells us kind of the different stations that are available in a given plant to use for making stuff. The last piece we need here is the product routing. And the product routing is the part of our recipe, if you will, that says first you put these ingredients here, and then you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. So the product routing takes the items in the bill of material, and references the work centers and tells us the steps that we need to do to engage in producing a material. So it is the operational component of the manufacturing process. And so it gives us a sequence. And the idea here is that you might see where the way we make this is we go to work center one, work center two, and work center three. And that is our standard process. But then, like sometimes happens in the real world, a key piece of equipment breaks in Work Center 2. And Work Center 2 is going to be down for the next two weeks. Well, an alternate way we could make this item would be Work Center 1, and then we could go Work Center 6, Work Center 8, and Work Center 12 to kind of take the place of the work that was done in Work Center 2 and, and then to Work Center 3 to finish it up. So the idea here is we could have alternate routings that the idea here is this is probably not the best way to do it, it's not the most efficient way to do it, but it'll get the job done. And so we can have a standard routing, we can have alternate routings, we can have parallel routings, which the idea would be, you know, we could and, and sometimes it does happen this way. Everything gets started in Work Center 1, and then we go to Work Center 2, and then to Work Center 3. But building off of what I had here, some of the output of Work Center 1 goes to Work Center 6, and then it goes to, and then it could go Work Center 8 to Work Center 12. But in fact, the order here is kind of arbitrary. So this could go Work Center 12 first and then to Work Center 8. And then ultimately it's going to go back to Work Center 3. So we could have alternate processes. We could have parallel processes. This would not be unusual in particular for a manufacturing facility that has extreme seasonality. You know, most of the year we operate in this manner right here. But you can imagine if you're the Hershey Chocolate Company, as we get closer to Halloween, the demand for chocolate gets, goes up. And so we bring to bear other manufacturing lines. We turn on equipment that we only use a certain period out of the year, and we use that to up our capacity. So the product routings give us the ability to do that. So um, it's going to list the operations, you know, do this first, then do this, then do this. It's going to sequence those. It's going to tell us work, what work center this work is to be done in. And it's going to give us times. And in particular, it's going to give us times divided into three different categories. Setup time, machine time, and human labor time. So we could have something that human beings come in and set up the equipment. And that takes them 20 minutes. 
And then once they've done that, they push a button and they can go away and work on something else while the machine works on it for another hour. And then at the end of that hour, items kind of come out of the equipment and move to another work center for, for them to continue the process here. So we have the ability to divide out the human labor and how it's being spent. Are they just setting things up? Are they actually doing the work? And then how much of this is machine time versus human hand time doing things? And then we have component assignment. This is the assignment of materials to an operation. And what's important here is this is now the relationship between the bills of material and, and the actual manufacturing process. Think of it this way. Here's a bill of material for making blueberry muesli. And maybe in our factory, the way we make blueberry muesli is this guy right here. This work center one, work center two, and work center three. And work center three is where things get put into bags and boxes, okay? But imagine that when you make cereal, I have no idea how you make breakfast cereal, but imagine work center one, they mix together all of the ingredients. And then they send those to work center two. And work center two is a drying oven. And you put the ingredients in work center two, and they stay there for three days while they're baked at a low temperature to dry them out. And then they get loaded into bags and boxes. Well, based on what I just told you, if we start the manufacturing run on Monday, Monday we mix the stuff up, and then it goes to work center two on Monday as well. What I say, it takes three days to bake, so it's going to bake Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and we're not going to be ready to put it into bags and boxes on Thursday. Do I need to pull the bags and boxes out of the warehouse on Monday? No. I mean, I need to make sure I have them so that when the time comes to put this stuff in a bag in a box, I have it, but there's no sense in me pulling everything out that I need for this whole process and having it available on day one. Think about, as we've referred to, the construction of the football stadium. At some point, they'll be ready to put the seats into the stadium. Well, do you need the seats sitting there on day one when you start digging holes in the ground? I mean, you might not actually need the seats until nine months later. The product routing tells us, okay, here's the things you're going to need that are on the bill of material, but this is where in the process it's actually going to be needed. It's going to be needed in work center three, and we can then do a calculation based on times and sequences to figure out exactly when that is. Now, we don't have to do it that way. We have two choices here. We can take every item on the bill of material, and we can assign it to a step in the routing. But if we don't want to do that, then everything will be automatically assigned to the first operation. Because maybe when you're making a bicycle, the whole thing happens in one afternoon. So we go and fetch all the stuff, and we bring it to the manufacturing line, and we give it to the person at Work Center 1, and we're done. Or, like I said, it could well be that some things we deliver on Monday, some things we deliver on Tuesday, some things we pull out on Thursday. We have the liberty to do that however we want. You can either assign the items to an individual uh, work center and, and operation, <coughs> or you can elect not to do that, in which case it's assumed that it all belongs to the first work center and the first operation. All right, well, this is a good place for us to stop for today. Have a good rest of the week. If you did not sign in, uh, please make sure you come up here and do that before you head out.